Hey, good morning, Sunrise family. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. I can't wait for you to hear today's sermon from Pastor Jerome as he's unpacking missional living through Revelation. So, so if you haven't been going through the series, make sure that you can go to sunrisefallberg.com, which I know you can, and there's actually a bookmark that you can see each week's readings, so you can stay just kind of just be reading and praying ahead of each sermon. It, it, it's great. So sunrisefallberg.com, you'll see it right there on the homepage, and or I'll mail you one. If you email Greg at sunrisefallberg.com and say, hey, I want a bookmark that you printed. I will email it to you. I mean, I will not email. I'll actually mail you a hard copy or I'll deliver it to your house. So Greg at sunrisefallbrook.com and say, I want a bookmark. That'd be great. But while you're, you're wanting things, I want you to go get your communion elements because we're going to take communion. And, and don't forget, communion is just a beautiful symbol of what the Lord sacrifices for us, his broken body. His blood poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. So make sure you get your elements and we'll do it together. All right, so uh, other things going on. If you can and you want to be here on October 14th, it's a Saturday. We're going to be doing an all church work day and we're going to serve a yummy breakfast first. It starts at 7 a.m. and we're only going to work to about 11. So from 7 to 11, but breakfast is first October 14th if you want to join us. If you don't want to join us, just pray for us. We want to make sure no one with power tools gets hurt or anything like that, especially Ryan Hunt. All right, I think I got it all covered, but we, we love you. And, and again, we have a Savior and Jesus Christ. And today, October 1st, this Sunday of 2023, is the perfect day, just like every day, to worship Him. Let's do that together right now. Heavenly Father, I pray that, that you had just kind of move Pastor Jerome aside, fill him full of your Holy Spirit as he brings your word to us today. Your word that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, let us just hear those words, and we ask that your Holy Spirit would tuck those words deep into our heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, and we want to always speak encouragement, hope, and love to a world that so desperately needs you. So Lord, again, bless this time now, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome again to church. Here we are, and we're going to be in Revelation again, of course, and we're looking at a, a chapter, the end of chapter one, and then actually I had those who were reading along read all seven of the letters to the churches, and so that's chapter two and chapter three. We are not going to read all of that today, but we're going to read a sampling in chapter two uh, from Christ's letter to the church in Ephesus. But let's start off in chapter 1. This is Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. It says, I, John, your brother and companion, and the suffering and kingdom and patience that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus. Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like a bronze were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and of the seven golden lampstands is this, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. 
And then he goes on in chapter 2, verse 1, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people that you have tested and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, I became a Christian as a young teenager back in the 70s, and one of the most influential books I read back then was called Guide to Survival by, by an author named Salem Kerbin. And the cover reads like this. This is actual. This in big, bold print on the cover. It says, How the World Will End. Sometime in the near future, several million people will suddenly disappear from this earth in the twinkling of an eye. When this happens, and if you still remain, then read this book, for it will be your guide to survival. Now, this book book was first published back in 1968, but it sold more than any other nonfiction book during the 70s, over a quarter of a million copies, to be exact. And since then, after it was updated back in 1990, it went on to sell over a half a million copies. But back when I was in high school, this book was constantly under my arm wherever I went, along with another one by Hal Lindsey called The Late Great Planet Earth. Those are the books I had under my arm right by my Bible. Now, since then, another popular book series has come out called Left Behind, and this one has outsold them all. But one thing all three of these books have in common is that they all teach that the church will be raptured or snatched up out of this world and into heaven to be with Christ before this time of great tribulation and global disaster strikes the earth. Now, my young Christian friends and I at that time were so convinced that this was true, we spent a large part of our time leaving the first two books I mentioned in strategic places so that hopefully someday our unbelieving friends would find them and have some kind of guide to survival after we were all raptured and they were left behind. Some of us even put bumper stickers on our cards that read, warning, in case of rapture, this car will be unmanned. Now folks, regardless of what you think of this, that was no joke to us. We were totally sincere and we were extremely zealous. And folks, here's the point. When it comes to what theologians call eschatology or the doctrine of the last things, we have got to be extremely humble in our teaching and in our understanding and deeply respectful of all those who may differ from us. We must remain teachable because be sure of this, good, solid Bible teachers and scholars across the spectrum do not agree when it comes to this subject or for that matter, when it comes to interpreting the whole book of Revelation. Sometimes we just have to graciously agree to disagree. You know, don't forget, many devout, God-fearing Jewish teachers and scholars of Jesus' day were convinced that they knew exactly what was going to happen when the Messiah would first appear. They knew how he would go about fulfilling all the prophecies that they knew by heart. You know, they could cite you every chapter and every verse but they were wrong. Why? Because they had actually misread and misunderstood many of the prophecies they thought they knew so well. They tried to squeeze everything into their own preconceived system rather than staying open to what God was really up to all along. It was was a classic case of my mind is made up, don't confuse me with the facts. 
Folks, this insidious disease is epidemic in our world today, and it's especially in the explosive arena of politics and religion. And it's rampant, both in our surrounding culture as well as in the church. So with this in mind this morning, I want us to try to take a fresh look at the mission of the church in the book of Revelation. And because it's such a crucial subject, we're going to take two Sundays on this, today and next week as well, so we can just examine it. See, according to many popular expositions of Revelation, the church only appears in the first three chapters of this book, and then we never or rarely hear about them again until the very end of the book. Why? Well, according to many of these teachers, it's because somewhere between chapters 3 and 4 of Revelation, the church will be raptured into heaven. The church has left the building, so to speak, and they're now safe and secure in the arms of Jesus. But in the meantime, the rest of the world must face this horrific persecution of the, but the Antichrist and, and the judgment of God in a series of cataclysmic plagues. They're left behind to fend for themselves. So from chapter 6 on, they say, the whole rest of Revelation is basically addressed to unbelievers and to those who come to Christ after the rapture and during the Great Tribulation, including 144,000 Jews who will someday be converted to Christ, they say, and become faithful martyrs who resist the lie of the beast. That is the very familiar blueprint that's taught in many books like Guide to Survival and Left Behind. And folks, it is by far the most popular understanding of Revelation that's taught today, and especially among the vast majority of evangelicals. But see, here's the question we have to ask today. And again, we must do it in all humility and with true respect to all those who may disagree with us. Is this the way the early church and the original readers of Revelation would have interpreted this book? Is it? Is this the way John would have understood it? And even more importantly, is this the way God originally meant for this book to be interpreted? See, the fact is, this particular approach to interpreting Revelation was virtually unknown until the 19th century when certain Bible teachers like C.I. Schofield and John Darby began to popularize it. But folks, think about the words of Jesus himself. You know, what did he say in the upper room when he's praying his final prayer for his disciples before his arrest and crucifixion? Jesus prays, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. As you sent me into the world, he prays, I have sent them into the world. Now, our contention today is that this prayer of Jesus is much more in keeping with the true intent and purpose of Revelation than what we typically hear in many evangelical circles. It's also more in keeping with what the Apostle Paul preached when he said, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, he says, continue in what you have learned and have been become convinced of. 2 Timothy 3, 12 through 14. So as we'll see in a minute, this is the missional spirit and God's true intention for his church that actually dominates the entire book of Revelation. But here's the good news today, just as Jesus assures us in the Gospel of John. I have told you these things, he says, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. The word here is thalipsis, that actually means tribulation. In this world you will have tribulation. But take heart, he says, I have overcome the world. Folks, again, as we're about to see throughout Revelation, Christ's constant call to his church is that she would see herself as victorious and as an overcomer, specifically because he is victorious and he has already overcome death, hell, and the devil. See, in Revelation, the victim becomes the victor, just as Christ did on the cross. 
So turn with me to chapter 1 of Revelation. We're intentionally going to backtrack, backtrack a bit today. For the last couple of Sundays, we've been exploring the playbill of Revelation, so to speak. We've been looking at all the key characters and actors in this very vivid drama. Who are they? That's our question. What is their mission? What role do they play? And how can knowing that help us understand this whole book better? So far, we've looked at the mission of our awesome God and creator, you know, the one who sits on the throne of heaven in chapter four. And last week, we looked at the mission of the slaughtered lamb in chapter five. But just what is the mission of the church in Revelation? Look at verse nine here of chapter one. I, John, your brother and companion, in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And then he says, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, all of these were actual churches in very real historical cities. Back in 2014, I had the amazing opportunity to visit the remains of all seven of these cities with Jim Fowler, and it was an eye-opening experience for sure. The Roman province of Asia was located on the western seaboard of what's now known as Turkey. And if you were to take a map and look at it, you can see that the seven cities mentioned here in chapter one appear in the very same order that a courier would travel as he delivered the mail. Sailing from the island of Patmos, he'd first arrive at Ephesus, and then he'd travel north to Smyrna and Pergamum, and then he'd come back down south to Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia, and finally he'd come full circle and deliver John's letter to the church at Laodicea. But get this, when each of these seven churches would read this prophetic letter from John, it's not like they would only read the specific part of the letter that was addressed to them. No, they would listen, listen intently to the whole thing, the entire letter, all 22 chapters, as it was read to them out loud during a church service. So Ephesus would hear what was written to Smyrna and Pergamum and so on and vice versa. It would be like listening to the entire script of a dramatic play in one sitting. Now, each one of Christ's letters or messages to each church is very personal. And each message takes seriously the specific concrete circumstances that were being faced by each particular church at that time. But at the same time, something deeper and more symbolic is also going on, something far beyond the immediate circumstances affecting these particular churches, something eternal and lasting. In the book of Revelation, seven is the number of completeness, as we've said. So by addressing seven churches, John indicates that Christ's message here to these specific churches is also representative of his message to all churches at all times. Folks, the spiritual condition we find in each of these seven churches still exists in the churches of our own day. And that means Christ's message to them remains the same as his message to us. It has not changed. It's not determined by the ebb and flow of our constantly changing culture. No, this is the word of the Lord. In verse 19 of chapter 1, John receives his divine commission. Write, therefore, what you have seen and what is now and what will take place later. Now, many interpreters of Revelation see a very intentional or schematic system here. They'll say the phrase, what you have seen, refers to chapter 1. What is now points to the seven letters to the seven churches. And what will take place later, they say, refers to the vast majority of the book. Chapters 4 through 22, which they suggest is all about the future. It's all very neat and perfectly chronological. But folks, actually, it's much more likely that this phrase, Revelation 119, applies to the book as a whole. This is how we are to read the whole book. See, in Revelation, there's this constant movement back and forth and up and down between heaven and earth and back and forth between the past, present, and future 
throughout the entire thing. This is not a linear chronological book. In other words, the entire content of Revelation is meaningful to every church that has existed in the past and that exists today and that will exist in the future. The consistent divine message that we have here is one of comfort and warning and assurance to all believers, past, present, and future. This is a book that is alive and active, filled with the power of God's Spirit. Write, therefore, the Lord says, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. But now look at verse 12, and here we find a very fascinating phrase. I turned around, John says, to see the voice that was speaking to me. You know, how do you see a voice? We typically hear a voice, right? But this happens over and over again throughout Revelation. John hears something, but when he turns to look, he sees something way deeper and way more extraordinary than anything he could ever imagine with just his five senses. On the Lord's day, or on Sunday, I was in the spirit, he says, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. And after turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet, and wrapped around the chest with a golden sash. You know, according to the book of Daniel, one like a son of man refers to the preexistent heavenly being who comes to establish a divine kingdom that cannot be destroyed. In Daniel 7, verse 13, I saw in night visions, Daniel says, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came up to the Ancient of Days, or God the Father, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, Daniel says, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. See, clearly what both Daniel and John see here is the exalted and risen Lord Jesus Christ himself. Throughout the gospel, Son of Man was Christ's favorite way of referring to himself. It's a phrase that can simply mean human being, but at the same time, it also has all these prophetic overtones that point unmistakably to this mysterious divine being in Daniel. It's the perfect title for our Lord Jesus, who's both fully God and fully man. But look here at our passage again in Revelation. You know, just where do we find the risen Christ in verse 13? Right smack in the middle of the seven golden lampstands. In the very last verse of this chapter, John tells us specifically that the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So we don't have to guess at the symbolic meaning here. Folks, don't miss this. What a comforting word this would have been to the persecuted churches of John's day. And what an encouraging word for us today. Jesus is alive and well and in the very middle of it all. That's what he's saying. Or as Daryl Johnson says so well, the glorified son of man is in the middle. Not above, looking down, not outside, looking in, but in the middle, right there in the middle of the churches, which is why in each of the messages that Jesus then dictates to the seven churches, Jesus can say, I know. I know what's happening in and among you. I know your hard work. I know your struggles. I know your fears. I know your pain. I know your emptiness. The risen, living Jesus lives and moves among his churches and he is moving among us right now. You know, what a beautiful thing that Christ would identify so strongly and so completely with us. It reminds me of when Christ appears to Saul in its blinding light out on the Damascus Road. Remember, Saul's been harassing and arresting Christians, and now Christ appears to him in this light. And do you remember what he says? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then when Saul asks, who are you, Lord? He replies, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. See, the Son of Man stands in the middle of the seven lampstands yesterday, today, and forever. He is intimately connected to us and with us, and he is forever and always for us. So that means when the church is injured, Christ is injured. You know, when we hurt, he hurts. When the church is victorious, he rejoices with us. 
Surely I am with you always, he says, even to the very end of the age. Who then shall separate us from the love of Christ, Paul asks. So trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Folks, this is the overarching and all-important message that Christ wants to get across to his church of every age and every generation. But the only way we'll ever fulfill our divine mission is by becoming overcomers in the power of the risen Christ. That is what Revelation is telling us. See, if the church is somehow snatched out of this world, what would that mean? That would mean evading all responsibility for Christ's mission in the world. No, our calling is not to disappear or evacuate or simply look out for number one when the world's falling apart. That has never been and never will be the way of the church of Jesus. Our calling is to follow the Lamb of God into this world as his faithful, courageous, and dissident disciples. Folks, listen, it's time to start understanding Revelation for what it truly is. It's not some kind of sanctified crystal ball for inquiring minds. No, it is an urgent call to resistance against the overwhelming idolatry of Babylon, the Babylons of our day, and the power-hungry ways of the surrounding empire. In the book of Revelation, Christ himself instructs the seven churches of Asia Minor on how to live as Christian dissidents in an empire that's racked by violence and power and exploitation and arrogance. And of course, these are the very sins we continue to struggle with in our own age to this very day. As Scott McKnight says, a dissident is a person of hope someone who imagines a better future world and then begins to embody that world. It's someone who speaks to promote that better future vision and against what is wrong in the present. The renowned New Testament professor Richard Hayes puts it like this. He says, the book of Revelation is above all else a political resistance document. It refuses to acknowledge the legitimacy and authority of earthly rulers and looks defiantly to the future when all things will be subjected to the authority of God. He says it seeks to rally the seven churches to a stance of courageous witness against a culture that dangles seductive defilements before the people of God, seeking impossible to lead even the saints astray. Folks, if we're truly reading Revelation honestly, without any preconceived agendas or systems, surely... That is Christ's message to the churches of every age, past, present, and future. Again, as McKnight says, John had his eyes on the evil powers at work in the empire, as well as those same powers at work in the church. He saw too much Rome in the church and not enough church in Rome. You know, Malcolm Geit, this wonderful poet, he's a Christian pastor, he once told of an incident that kind of sums all of this up. Once while he was photocopying some of his poems for a talk he was giving, the copying machine was suddenly jammed. And when a technician arrived to fix it, he told Geit with a laugh, he kind of chuckled, and he said, your poetry is jamming my machine. Well, Geit was so fascinated by the technician's words, he turned this little phrase into a poem. And here's what he called it. Here's the name of the poem. On being told my poetry was found in a broken photocopier. That's the title. I mean, of course, what else would you call it, right? But here are the closing words of this poem. Listen to this, here's what he wrote. My poetry is jamming your machine with pictures copied from a world unseen. Wow. Folks, if you, if you wanted to sum up the mission of the church according to Revelation, you couldn't put it much better than that. See, the poetic imagery in Christ's letters to the churches were spoken in order to jam the empire's idolatrous machine and to point the world and the church to a new and better way at last. And just look at the divine author behind all this poetic imagery. You know, who else could speak a more penetrating and piercing word to his people than him? Look again at verse 13 here in chapter 1. The Son of Man whom John sees is dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet. That's the clothing of a priest. The risen Christ is a priest, or the one mediator between God and humanity. You know, the Latin word for priest literally means 
bridge builder, the glorious one that John sees here in his vision is the one who bridges this infinite chasm between us and God. And he can do so perfectly because he is both fully God and fully man. He, he, he gets it. He completely understands both sides. Jesus is our great high priest. And notice here, John says he has a golden sash around his chest. In ancient times, when a belt was worn around the waist, it meant that a person was preparing for work. But when a belt was worn across or around his chest, it meant that the person was now resting from his work because his task had been accomplished. And when he had breathed his last upon the cross, Jesus cried out, remember, it is finished. The high priestly work of the Lamb of God is fully finished and complete. And we see that over and over again in Revelation. As the writer of Hebrews says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, meaning Christ himself, when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. But now get this. In the book of Daniel, God himself, or the Ancient of Days, as he's called, is described like this from Daniel 7, 9. As I look, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire. But now here in Revelation, what does John say about the Son of Man? The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. Folks, once again, we realize that Jesus, the Son of Man, shares the very character and being of God Almighty. Like the Ancient of Days, he too is God. He is the second person of the Holy Trinity, the very Son of God. White like wool, as white as snow, symbolizes the ageless, timeless wisdom of Jesus as well as his absolute purity and sinlessness. And his eyes were like a blazing fire, John says. In other words, the eyes of our glorified Lord not only look at us, they look right through us. Nothing is hidden from his sight. He sees us for who we are. His piercing, purifying vision penetrates all the mask and all the false personas we try to hide behind. See, only the risen Christ can look right through all our sinful facades and burn away all the junk that tries to ruin our lives. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, John says. In other words, he stands strong and firm and steady. He has already been tested and refined by the fire himself. And now, unlike all the other shaky kingdoms of man, his kingdom rests on feet that endure forever. His voice, John says, is like the sound of a great cascading waterfall. You can imagine it fills the listener with awe and wonder, and it drowns out all the other babbling, lying voices around us. In his right hand, he holds seven stars, which are the angels of the seven churches, and out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. Folks, as we've said before, the sword that proceeds from the mouth of Christ is the word of God. It's the word of truth and life that cuts through all the lies and double talk and, and deceptive gaslighting that characterizes our own culture. And in the end, be sure of this, it is God's word alone that will conquer. And finally, John says, his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. The Lord bless you and keep you. Remember Aaron's benediction? The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. And so what happens immediately then? What happens after John sees this stunning vision? He falls at Christ's feet like a dead man. Just like Isaiah before him, when John comes face to face with the Lord, he's totally undone. He knows he's a man of unclean lips. And now he's completely ruined as he stands before the gaze of such a holy, righteous God. But look here at verse 17. Look what happens. This, this is so Jesus. Instead of rebuking him, right? Instead of crushing or destroying him. Instead of sending an angel of some sort. No, he, he personally comforts him. 
He reaches out and touches John with his right hand, and he says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death in Hades. Not Caesar, say that. Not the Roman Empire, not Putin or Russia, not Biden or Trump, not even the devil and all the powers of darkness. No, I myself, says the Son of Man, I alone. So do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Because I live, you will live also. Folks, this is the one who gives us our mission as the church, as the very body of Christ here upon the earth. And if this is who he truly is, And what he stands for, then man, what about us? What do we stand for? How will we respond? Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? This is the good news, folks, at the very heart of Christ's message to all of the seven churches of Asia Minor and to the church of the 21st century as well. But now, okay, if we truly want to be a faithful witness, just as Christ has been a faithful witness to us, then our mission as the church must bear the same character, the same integrity, you know, the same methodology that our master demonstrated when his father sent him into the world. That's the concern of these letters to the churches. And that's Christ's challenge throughout chapters 2 and 3 as he directly and personally addresses these churches one at a time. Now, for those of you who are keeping up with our weekly readings in Revelation, you've hopefully already read and meditated on these seven letters to the churches before you're watching this video. And if you haven't done that, I just, again, encourage you to pick up one of those Revelation bookmarkers that we have in the lobby. And if you can't get to church, just call us. We'll mail or send it to you so that you can follow along even better each Sunday. Okay, so obviously we don't have time to go through each message now to each one of these seven churches. But next Sunday, we're going to come back to this subject of the church's mission in Revelation. Let me just say this about these letters as we come to a close. When you look closely here, there's this very obvious pattern in the way each one of these letters are composed. Their message differ for sure, with some longer, others shorter. But each one consists of seven crucial parts. So first of all, for each letter, there's a commission. It's a commission from Christ to write. Each one of these personal letters begins the same way. To the angel or the messenger of the church in Ephesus, write. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write. To the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, and so on. Then secondly, in all these letters, there's a description of the character of Christ. As every church is specifically addressed, a unique description of the character of Christ is revealed or highlighted. And get this, it's it's always a characteristic that directly relates to the specific situation that church is facing. For example, John will write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Or these are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. To the church of Pergamum, so interesting, he writes, these are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. The symbol for the city of Pergamum at this time was the sword. That was their, their symbol because it was one of the few cities that Rome had actually given the power to inflict capital punishment. But see, Christ knew a much bigger battle was actually going on there. The church in Pergamum was engaged in a battle for the mind, It was a battle of ideas. That's why Christ says, I will come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth, meaning the word of truth. Then to another church, John writes, these are the words of him who is holy and true, or these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness. Okay, then thirdly, in all these letters, there's a commendation. What? Words of encouragement or affirmation or approval that Christ gives to commend what pleases him. I know your deeds, he says to the church of Ephesus, your hard work and your perseverance. I know your afflictions and your poverty, he says to the poor church of Smyrna. Yet you are rich. I know your deeds, he tells the church in Thyatira, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. And then fourthly, we typically find in all these letters 
a word of complaint. Yet, he says, I hold this against you. You know, whether it's due to idolatry or sexual immorality or compromise in our Christian witness, Christ does not hold back. He doesn't remain silent in the face of evil. Now, what does he do? He, he dares to speak the truth into our lives. That is what real love looks like. For example, to the church of Laodicea, Christ famously says, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other. But because you're lukewarm, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Strong words, serious words, you know, hardly words of commendation. And yet, even for this church, folks, even for the church of Laodicea, there is hope. Here I am, Christ tells them at the end of his letter to them. I stand at the door and knock. Don't leave me out here. Don't leave me standing outside. Don't shut me out. Open the door and I will come in and fellowship with you once again. You know, the Balaamites and the Nicolaitans were teaching that it was okay to practice all kinds of sexual immorality as long as it wasn't hurting anyone. But contrary to this so-called tolerant anything-goes society, Jesus says, those whom I love, I rebuke in discipline. He didn't criticize us in order to tear us down or destroy us, but to wake us up and call us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. So folks, what about us then? You know, what, what about us here at Sunrise? Are, are we lukewarm? Or are we all in and passionate in our walk with Christ? Are we asleep at the wheel? Or are we fully awake and attentive to what God is up to? Are we dead? Or are we alive? And then fifthly, because Christ always speaks the truth in love, he never condemns the church in these letters, but instead he provides a word of correction for us. He leads us in new paths of righteousness. Repent, he says. What does that mean? Change your old way of thinking. Don't be transformed or don't be conformed to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and heart. And then finally, in each one of these seven letters, Jesus leaves us with both a command and a commitment, or, or a promise, we could say. Sometimes they come in the reverse order of what you see here, but they're always there. Whoever has ears, Jesus says, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's his command. And then he offers a promise, or he, he makes a commitment to all those who overcome. To the one who overcomes, he says, or to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life. To the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Folks, Revelation was originally written to churches that were constantly being tempted to compromise their convictions and to live just like the sinful world all around them. But according to these seven letters to the churches, either we follow the lamb or we follow the dragon. It's one or the other. There's no middle ground. As far as Christ is concerned, when it comes to fulfilling our mission in this world, there can be no waffling or straddling the fence. In fact, the point of most of these letters is clearly to challenge indecisive Christians to live lives of full, wholehearted devotion. Scott McKnight writes, how do you live in a world that is anti-God, devoted to opulence, consistently opposed to the way of the Lamb, full of itself and intent on being impressive, protected by a mighty military and aiming to become the global superpower? How do you live in a world of constant internal betrayals, driven by economic exploitation of anyone and everyone, structured into a mysterious hierarchical system of power and honor and driven by arrogance and ambition? In short, he asked, how does one escape Babylon while living in it? And the answer Folks, according to Revelation, the only way we can stay true to Christ and his mission of good news, the only way to live as faithful followers of the Lamb, even as we're stranded in Babylon, is to reclaim our first love. Just as Jesus tells the Ephesian church, and to keep the beautiful face of the Lamb ever before us. That's what John does, right? First love is a love that always has time for the beloved. It's not simply zealous and dogmatic, it's lovingly attentive and eager, seeking to please, extravagant. Instead of staring out the world in bitter anger, constantly groaning and complaining about how bad everything's become, John is in the spirit on the Lord's day. He's focused on what pleases his beloved. And as a result, 
He sees reality as it really is. He sees one like the Son of Man standing right in the middle of the seven golden lampstands. And his face is like the sun shining in all its warmth and brilliance. Friends, today our risen Lord Jesus says to each and every one of us, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death. In Hades. Oh, may God grant us the grace to follow this Jesus into God's new creation. Amen. You know, in just a moment, we're going to take communion together. Again, let's prepare our hearts and come to this table as Christ says, Come to me and eat. Amen. Tell the world of the
the treasure you found. You know, every time we come to this table, we're really, it's like a dress rehearsal for, for the wedding supper of the Lamb. That's what we hear about in Revelation. That's when God, as the, as the great groom, Jesus, invites his bride to come and celebrate this great meal together. So that's what we're doing today. Jesus takes the bread. He's the host of the table. He's the groom of the church. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is my blood, Jesus says. It's the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you. This is what makes the new heavens and the earth, new earth possible. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. And now take your elements that you have, and we're going to do this together as the body of Christ, wherever you are. Take and eat, Jesus says. This is my body. Drink this in remembrance of me. This is my blood poured out for you. O Lamb of God, we give you great praise today. Help us to see, Lord, with eyes of faith. Help us to be in the Spirit as John was, so that we can see things as you see them and be filled with joy and hope. Thank you for drawing us together as your eternal family and for loving us even unto death. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.